and welcome to the Tractatus. This is one of the most important books in philosophy of language. So one thing that I want to say is uh, don't give up on it. Um, don't be intimidated by it. There are some really heavily logical sections, and I realize now that they are in chapters four and five especially. Don't sweat those chapters. The really important chapters are one and two, and I'm sorry I didn't say that on the thing, one and two, a little bit of three, and then six and seven. So the, there's a typo, right? Focus on one, two, three, six, and seven. So you're about to meet the early Wittgenstein. So you're going to meet some key terms here. Atomism is the view that all words are separate and all facts are separate. So you don't have causal relationships between things. And what he's doing with this atomism is he's setting up this notion that maybe the cat is on the mat, or maybe the cat is on the floor, or maybe the cat is on the table, and all of these are fundamentally independent facts. So they might all be true, and they might all be false. And he's doing this partly because I think this is the way that symbolic logic works is you evaluate the truth of each variable in a sentence separately and then you put it together. Um, another thing that I want to bring out is in the Tractatus the early Wittgenstein brings out this notion that language is referential. He is inventing what is called the picture theory of meaning and he is a picture theorist. So at least in this book he goes on and says that he refuted himself later on but you have this notion that words paint pictures of the world or sentences paint pictures of the world. And I, I say that it's naive in here because there is this naive realism in the Tractatus where he's just um, mapping language directly onto both our thoughts and the world and saying that it all works out, it all makes sense. The later Wittgenstein, as you'll discover, um, doesn't believe in any of this. Um, he throws away the atomism, he throws away the referentiality, he goes for meaning as being about how we use the words rather than what is going on in the world. He refers to language as a game, we'll talk more about that later, and he makes arguments about certain aspects of language that are that are kind of small but he's realized that Language is so complicated that you have to just take little parts. So one of his famous later arguments is that private language is impossible. And we'll talk about that much later as well. Okay, so welcome to the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, yay. Um, the reading that you have, I really, really like it because it has the German, it has Anscombe's translation, and then it has the translation by David Piers. Um, Piers and Anscombe were both students of Wittgenstein, so their translations are taking, taken from their notes and their personal experiences, but it's kind of fun to see how they disagree. Now, and it's also a great addition because you can compare it back to the German if you're taking German. So I really love this particular reading for you. But like I said, please don't feel intimidated you don't have to read the German version, right? Just pick one. My favorite is Piers. I've never been crazy about GEM Anscombe. I feel like she is misinterpreting him sometimes, but you know, I wasn't a student, so I have my opinions. I kind of like your translation. So here we go. He starts to lay out a theory of language. Famously, the world is all that is the case. That is what is true. Right, so I'm going to add little parenthetical remarks, but I'm going to try to quote as much as possible from the text, and I'm going to try to tell you when it's my opinion and when it's just a quote from the text. So he's defining what is all that is the case. He's defining what is out there. What is it? It's the world. So he's setting up definitions for us. The world is a totality of facts that is atomic facts, not of things. So he's trying to bring us away from feeling like language and metaphysics are absolutely one and the same. Rather, language is something that will map on to metaphysics. So he's really setting out this notion that we are working in language and that this is philosophy of language. And 
This is about us. This is a human endeavor. So this book is going to be about the boundaries of our thought. And it's about logical facts, linguistic states of affairs, delineating the way that we think. This is not contingent. This is the boundary of our universe. And you'll see that more as he progresses into the later chapters. So going now into chapter two, words create a picture of the world. That is true insofar as it maps onto the world. So a picture represents a possibility in logical space. Let me go back to the example of the cat is on the mat, right? Um, you're thinking that the cat is on the mat. Maybe that sentence is true. Maybe it is false. What do you do? You have to go check, see where the cat is. Um, so you're understanding the truth of the sentence in your head and then checking to see if it maps onto the world. A logical picture of facts is a thought. So, right, so he's uniting language and thinking and concepts and the world as it actually is. How are all of these things interconnected? Many people have argued that Wittgenstein takes a very Kantian view of the world. So remember back in the day when you were reading the Critique of Pure Reason and you were thinking about, oh my goodness, there are conditions for the possibility of understanding and experience. And these conditions for the possibility of understanding and experience shape our world, they shape our thoughts, right? We could not have experiences without space or the object being spatial. We cannot have experiences that are outside of time. And so Wittgenstein is saying, ha ha, it's not space and time, it's a language, right? The structure of a proposition shows how we project ourselves onto the world. We would not be able to say what an illogical world would look like. He takes names to be the things that fasten us to the world. Um, names kind of hook on to the world directly, and then the logical structure that comes out of our minds that links the world together for us. It links it together propositionally, right over, under, next to, ahead of, behind. It links it causally with if-thens. Uh, it links it disjunctively with ors, right? Uh, but names are these primitive signs. So notice that he's breaking with his teacher, Bertrand Russell. He's saying that we are completely against description theory. Names are just these hooks that fasten us to the world and help us lay our logical structure across it. This leads him to one of the most Im important claims in the Tractatus. We get confused when we use signs wrongly, and we use signs wrongly all the time. So Frege's puzzle, what is up, Hesperus, Phosphorus, Morning Star, Evening Star, Venus. If I say green equals green, right, that's not a tautology. I'm getting mixed up because it looks like a tautology, but it's really that we put a proper name in one slot and then an adjective in the other slot, and then we're all mixed up. And because we get confused about the nature of our language and the nature of reality, we think that, that we are mixed up about reality. This is just because we have not developed the, the perfect language yet. Um, I put Sarah's interpretation in this line because I paraphrased a lot of what he says, but he definitely does say language misleads us. And as much as he critiques Bertrand Russell throughout this, he is not a description theorist, he does agree that we need a perfect, sharp, elegant language and that language is what will help us understand ourselves and the world, dot, 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 big ellipsis there. 